and to the world I bowed and gave my every breath. Then to the earth he came to seek and save the lost, but I yelled crucify and nailed him to the cross, bound by my sin and shame. I called upon his name, each day I live safe in his grace. The King of Kings died in my place, each day I stand set free from sin. My King is crowned, I live in him. I see the empty tomb, the sting of death undone. My broken life is gone, I'm risen in the sun. A slave of righteousness, no longer bound by sin. I'm free to yield to him and serve the risen Lord, one with the crucified. For by his death I die, each day I live safe in his grace died in my place. Each day I stand set free from sin. My King is crowned. I live in Him. And then the day will come. We'll see our risen Lord in all His majesty. We will be restored in robes of righteousness. We'll stand before His throne. Our hope at last unveiled adopted as his own, one with the risen King. Forevermore we'll sing, each day we live safe in his grace. Died in our place, each day we stand set free from sin. Our King is crowned, we'll live with him. Thank you. you. May be seated. That's all right. That's all right. Good morning. A lot to be thankful for this morning. We are forever in the hands of the Holy One, who's with us here. It's our privilege to, as the song said, yield ourselves to Him and allow Him to work in us and through us and to remind us of His amazing grace and mercy. And so, before we open up the Word of God, let's pause for prayer. Father, we're grateful again for Your grace and Your majesty and Your holiness and Your absolute mercy. Thank You for your sending uh, Your Son to go to the cross and bear the brunt of the wrath of God on on our behalf. What an amazing act of love. Thank you that salvation is free and that uh, we are yours forever through simple faith in Christ. Thank you too for the Word of God. We ask the Spirit of God would direct in our thinking today that these truths uh, that are stinging that we'll see today uh, could just remind us of uh, your righteousness and your holiness and how you love all and that uh, we would just be mindful of who you are, uh, thankful for your amazing grace and and that uh, we can be built up and encouraged and edified through what we see today in your word. In Christ's name, amen. If you have your Bible with you, let me encourage you to open it to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew 23, we're going to cover some ground today. I had a conversation this week with someone who says, what have you been teaching on? He said, the life of Christ. How long have you been doing that? Five years. But we're, we're almost to the cross, and uh, it's been very good for me. I trust it's been very good for you. And, uh, and so we're going to see some sobering truths in the Word of God here this morning. You know, someone said, and I quote, there are many ways to go to hell, but perhaps the saddest way is by way of the church. And uh, that's a profound statement, and I echo the word sad there. Uh, you know, the church is something God designed to be the griller, griller, the pillar and ground of the truth. Uh, it's been the 
the thing to shine light into the darkness, and yet in many cases, it's the very thing obscuring the truth that God designed to set each individual free. Um, and one of the reasons that's the case is because of spiritual leadership uh, that does not teach the Word of God uh, with a desire to point people to Christ and to exalt the grace of God. And, uh, and they're confused. You know, some people go to hell because they don't believe in God, and that's obviously sad. Some go because they believe in a false God, which is also sad. But to go to a place that's supposed to give you the truth that'll set you free, and then to be told the opposite is especially sad. You know, people, I assume, are coming to a church because they want to hear that the truth uh, would be properly presented in such a way so they would understand the grace of God and understand that salvation is a free gift bought and paid for by the Lord Jesus Christ and is received through simple faith in Him. And the folks that go to church generally trust the leadership that's there to communicate uh, accurate information. And yet when those in the pulpit don't understand the grace of God and the free salvation, or are opposed to it, they don't fulfill their responsibility. And what awaits them is actually what parallels what we're gonna read here in Matthew chapter 23 here this morning. Jesus is gonna directly address the Pharisees for the last time, and the scribes who are in a position to speak the truth to the nation, but abdicated that responsibility. And because of that, many who wanted to go to heaven or enter the kingdom of God were prohibited from doing that because of the false teaching that they espoused. And so, this is nothing new. Those uh, in the nation of Israel that had the role of teaching the masses truths about God from the Bible, uh, unfortunately, were doing the opposite. This is an atrocity in the sight of God, and it's worthy of some of the greatest condemnation that's going to be uttered by the Savior when he walked on earth. In fact, what we have recorded here are the harshest words that come out of the Savior's mouth in his earthly ministry. And it brings to the surface the reality that religion has been especially used by Satan to blind the mind of those who do not understand or believe the gospel. You know, we're to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's the message of salvation. And yet what religion does is it blinds people and it perverts the gospel. We're going to see some woes today. But you know, Paul right out of the gate after he'd gone on his first missionary journey uh, and established a number of churches in Galatia, so he wrote him a letter and says, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you into the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another. But there's some who trouble you. And how do they trouble you? They want or they do, in fact, pervert the gospel of Christ. And that's the one message in the universe you do not want to pervert because according to Romans 1.16, it's the power of God to salvation to everyone that's willing to believe it. It was offered to the Jew first, it's offered to the Greek as well. And the message of the gospel is an expression of the grace of God. And when you see the grace of God, you recognize that it's the exact opposite of the merit principle. Whoa. Romans 11.6 says, but if it's by grace, it's no longer works, or on the basis of works, otherwise grace would no longer be grace. Grace and works are diametrically opposed. One is merit-based, the other is free in every way. And so, Anything that requires works to go to heaven nullifies the grace of God. It's a violation of the grace of God, and it actually strips the gospel of its power. And the fact is, is we need the grace of God desperately because all of us are in this basket right here. There is none righteous, no, not one. There's no one who understands. There's none who seeks after God. They've all turned aside. They've together become worthless. No one does good, not even one. There's nothing in us that makes us lovable to God, but he loves us in spite of us because that's who he is. And we actually deserve the wrath of God because we've sinned against God. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's no one that's made the great in any way, shape, or form. And God, in his mercy, gave his righteous standard through the law to show us our need of a Savior. This is brought out in Romans 3, 19 through 20. We know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are in the law, to what end? That every mouth may be stopped, and all the world would become guilty before God. And so the deeds of the law 
were not designed to justify or declare you righteous in God's sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. And, you know, doing surveys here at the fair this week, you tell people, well, have you lied? Well, yeah. Have you stolen? Well, yeah. Do you obey mom and dad? Well, not like I should. Well, that means you're a sinner. And you're a sinner by nature, and you're a sinner by position. You have Adam's sin imputed to your account. You inherited a sin nature, and so that results in individual sins, and thoughts, words, deeds, motives, and so forth. And so all these indicate that you are not righteous and therefore not worthy to enter heaven. And on top of that, you deserve God's just punishment for sin, which is death or separation, which will find its ultimate expression in the lake of fire. This is the bad news of the Bible. You know, God is just. He has to punish sin, but in love, this is the gospel, God punished his own son in our place, the innocent one dying in the place of the guilty. God became a man, lived a perfect life, and then willingly in love went to the cross to bear the wrath of God for you and me. And so when the whole world went dark on Good Friday, God's anger, judgment, punishment, wrath, and hatred for sin was poured out on Christ as he was made sin for us. And thankfully, he cried out, it is finished, which means paid in full. Your debt's been paid, my debt's been paid, and because sin has been taken care of, what separates an individual now from God is their willingness or unwillingness to trust Christ as their Savior. God wants to save you by the grace of God, and he does that through faith. Grace means you get something you don't deserve. You're saved how? Through faith. That's trust in Christ alone. And this, again, this salvation is not from you. It's a gift from God. It's not of work, so you have absolutely no reason to boast. The only thing you contribute to your salvation is the sins that put Jesus on the cross. He does it all. He gets all the glory, and we receive all the benefits. And again, Romans 6 brings this up. It's by grace. It's not from works. Or otherwise, grace is not grace. And if it's works, it's not from grace, or else work is no longer work. You, there's an unmixing of the two there. But because Christ did it all, and because his promise is true, 1 John 5, 13 tells us, these things are written on you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know you have eternal life. Oh. And that's the most wonderful thing there is because all of us are going to die. And we're going to be ushered into one of two places for all eternity. And you can know you have eternal life and know you're going to be with Christ forever on the one condition that you simply believe in him and him alone, plus nothing else. Because he's the savior, we're not co-saviors. But that's the trouble with religion. Religion muddies the waters. Religion is man's way, Christianity is God's way. Religion puts the onus on you to work for your salvation, and yet Christianity is the work of God for man. Religion says you're rewarded through your efforts and you can gain heaven, and yet the Bible's very clear, it's a gift from God. It's works versus grace. Religion will tell you that Christ is part of the equation, but there's more to it, and yet true Christianity is Christ alone. He's the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through him. Religion says you've got to do your part. Christianity says it's been done for you. Religion says achieve. Christianity says no, it's been accomplished. Religion tells you to try. Christianity puts the emphasis on you trusting what Christ already did for you. Religion, the best they can do is offer you a hope so, and yet in Christ you have a no so. Religion says you need us as a middleman. Christianity says you need Christ and him alone. Religion makes sin the issue. Christianity makes son the issue. There's a fear motivation when it comes to religion, and yet the issue in Christianity is will you put your faith in Christ? The emphasis there on law keeping, and yet here the emphasis is on how God loves you in Christ. Religion focuses on the external, Christianity the internal. Religion is religious. It's, there's a process to it, and yet Christianity says you become born again at a point in time and you're regenerated. Religion emphasizes the horizontal. Christianity emphasizes your vertical relationship with the Lord. Religion focuses on your actions, and this is a way of thinking, Christianity. Again, it's performance-based. Christianity is a personal relationship. These are things that are so important to understand. Uh, and again, like I've said, the water has been muddied, been muddied a great deal. And so Jesus, in his three-plus years of ministry on the earth, has been interacting with the Pharisees at different times, and uh, now it's time for him to let him have it, if you will. Uh, and that's what he does here in Matthew chapter 23. This encounter occurs on the Wednesday of Passion Week. Uh, Friday he'll be crucified. And this is, Matthew 23 records Jesus' last public sermon. And it's a, an amazingly scathing denunciation given to these religious leaders. 
Up until now, he's given them every possibility, every possible opportunity to change their minds about him and trust him as the true Messiah from heaven. But the more that they were confronted with the truth, the harder their hearts got. And that's the thing about the Word of God. It demands that you make a decision and you're either saying yes, thank you, or no, thank you, and one softens the heart, the other hardens the heart. And what we read here this morning is not pretty. In fact, A.T. Robertson called it a thunderbolt of wrath. And so in Matthew 23, if you hear last time we were in this, in the first 12 verses of Matthew 23, Christ actually talked to the crowd and in particular his disciples and now he's going to turn and talk directly to the Pharisees and scribes for the last time. So the first 12 verses, crowd and his disciples, from verse 13 to 36, it's spoken to the scribes and Pharisees directly. Directly. So he stops talking about them and starts talking to them. And he's doing this for the benefit of those listening, though, as well. And so though they need this information, so do the people around them need that information as well. And so in this scathing denunciation, six times Jesus calls them hypocrites. Five times he calls them blind. He calls them fools, calls them serpents, and calls them sons of hell. Now Jesus Christ is the epitome of love. He's love personified. And love rejoices in the truth, and sometimes the truth isn't always pretty, and sometimes says, well, why the harshness here? Well, because of the stakes involved. You know, when love, and Christ is speaking lovingly here, and when it speaks harshly, it does so because there's no other language that has a chance of breaking through. And so he's going to give them a scathing denunciation, hoping that when it's all said and done that they'd humble themselves, and even trust in Christ as Messiah. You know, Jesus never really addressed the common person this way. He reserved his harshest words for the religious leaders who led folks astray and practiced hypocrisy. And that's what we see here. In fact, more than any other group, the scribes and Pharisees were false teachers. Now, some were sincere. Some sought the truth. Nicodemus was a prime example of that. You've got Joseph of Arimathea as well. But the majority of them traded in the truths and wisdom of God for traditions and wisdom of men. And so in this section, Jesus will pronounce eight woes upon these scribes and Pharisees. Now, some commentators have made the observation that these woes that Jesus pronounces have a corresponding relationship to the Beatitudes, mentioned at the beginning, toward the beginning of his ministry. And we're gonna look at that here at the end. But what does woe mean? What are we talking about? It's a Greek word. It's used in several ways, but most often it's a loud, guttural outcry of pain. It's, it's coming from your bowels, if you will. Depending on the context, it's either fear or anger or an expression of grief and despair and sorrow. You know, woe is me. You've, you've probably heard that. And so the context ultimately dictates the nuance of the word. But since woe is an explanation of deep sorrow, the usage here could be translated, oh, the sorrow that awaits you, you Pharisees. The grief, the pain, the agony that awaits you is what he's saying here. And so he's going to cut to the chase and give it to him straight. And it's not going to be pretty. And so what's the first woe? We're going to pick up in verse 13. But, woe to you, you scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. Neither do you go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. And so, the first woe is because they shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. See, these religious leaders, through their teaching, kept people from the kingdom of heaven through their false teaching. They misled people by making human traditions and human religious rules more important than the teaching of God's word. And because of this, they were preventing people from entering into the kingdom of God. They were keeping people from being born again, as Christ said, you need to be born again and to enter the kingdom of God. You know, if someone is a, 
a preacher or a teacher that is true to the Lord, he will always point you to Christ. He will always point you to salvation, whether in any tense it's by the grace of God. It's not about rules and regulations, and yet the Pharisees did the opposite. And this is clearly seen because they openly and forcefully rejected Jesus. You know, if they had opened up the kingdom of God to men, they would have welcomed and received Jesus as the Messiah, as the Son of God, and they would have pointed the people that they ministered to, to Jesus as the Messiah and the Son of God, and they were doing the opposite. In fact, in a couple days, they're going to be responsible for murdering him. It's amazing. He says, you keep, verse 13, you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. Against men. It, the idea here is that you're shutting the doors of the kingdom of heaven before men is the idea here. That they're moving in the direction, and right when they get to it, you slam the door in their face so that they can't enter in. It's amazing, isn't it? And he says, you're not going in either. Not only are you not going in, but you're preventing other people from going in. And so if you can imagine someone standing at the door of the gate of the kingdom of God and slamming that gate shut for those who would like to go in. It's amazing. You really don't want to hear these words from the Savior. It's really not what you want to hear. You know, people looked up to them. People listened to them. People trusted them, hoping that they were the, the very ones that would give them the information they need so they could go to heaven. And here they did the opposite. The opposite. Shut their door in his faces. I still remember, it reminded me, as I, when I worked in the paper industry, and I led my boss to the Lord, and he went home and told his wife. And she said, how can one billion Catholics be wrong? She was trusting that they were giving her the information she needed to understand salvation. Well, eventually she saw it. But again, that's undoubtedly what the thought process was for some of these people that were listening to the Pharisees. How could they be wrong, right? But such is the travesty of false religion. And this typifies much of Christendom. You know, much of what is taught in churches, sadly, muddies the waters, clouds the grace of God. And again, instead of preaching that salvation is a gift of God provided totally by the grace of God through the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, through his complete payment on the cross, they add all kinds of additional things to the mix. Well, you've got to get baptized or confirmed, or you need to be faithful to God, or you need to try your best, or not sin certain sins, or repent from your sins, or clean up your life. I mean, the potential things that are added to the gospel, I mean, it's a long list. And then on top of it, you go to Africa and all you hear is about health and wealth and God wants you to have your best life now. And you just need faith, brother. And that trapped in that thing. And so there's so many different ways to pervert the gospel and it's being perverted everywhere so people that who want to go, that actually have a positive volition, that want to go to heaven, are prevented from going in through that false teaching. It's crazy, isn't it? In fact, there's an old story about a person who tried to join a church but kept being turned down for membership. He went home and prayed about it and Jesus said, don't worry, I've been trying to get into that church for 20 years myself. <laughs> and so here they want to go and right before they get there, someone slams a door in their face. It's not like these people are running away. They're coming in the right direction. You know, I still remember shortly after I started attending Kenwood Bible Chapel in the early 80s, uh, I was reading all kinds of books about evangelism, and I one put out, and I'm not, you know, it was put out by University Press, and I still remember, I think it was on page 72, it just still hits me, the neighbor was witnessing to a neighbor, they're having a conversation, and, and she says to her neighbor, do you see anything that's preventing you from trusting Christ? And she says, well, no, and she says, well, I do, that affair you're having. You gotta give up that affair before you get saved, I'm thinking, no, you don't. I got so mad. I go, if you had to clean up your life to go to heaven, where would you start? And where would you end? No, it was so wrong. In other words, apart from the 
actually, apart from the power of the Spirit of God working in and through you, you don't have a chance of giving up your sin at all. Never do you have to give up sin to get saved. In fact, the first person that Jesus had a personal conversation with on his way to Galilee from Jerusalem was a woman caught in adultery, or a woman, uh, woman at the well that had five husbands and was currently living with, without her husband. Did he say, you gotta dump that clown before you can get saved? No, not at all. Well, Jesus, you missed something here, man. That's what the Pharisees would say. In his Grace New Testament commentary, Heller writes, as the spiritual leaders, they are to be the doorkeepers of the kingdom, but they deserve judgment because they block others from gaining a knowledge of the truth. You don't want to be that guy. In fact, Jesus said this in a parallel passage in Luke. Woe to you, lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter in yourselves, and those who were entering in you hindered. And that's what false teaching does, and Satan is behind it all. His goal is to blind people to the truth of the gospel, and religion is one of his best ways of doing it. 2 Corinthians 3, 4 and 3 says, if our gospel is hidden, if it's veiled, who is it hid to? Them that are lost, and whom the God of this world, small g, that's Satan, has blinded the minds. It's a thinking thing, not a doing thing, which believe not, lest the light of the glorious, of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine into them. They're blinded through false teaching. He blinds them. Self-righteousness, the list is endless. And so that's woe number one, but he doesn't stop there. Second woe is because they take advantage of the vulnerable. Notice verse 14. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense you make long prayers, therefore you're gonna receive the greater condemnation. You devour widows' houses. Using clever and dishonest dealings, the scribes and Pharisees said it would actually steal widows' houses. In other words, instead of, it, it seems like in the course of bringing spiritual comfort to widows, these false religious leaders use their influence to deceive widows into turning over to them their finances and sometimes their homes. See, that doesn't happen today, does it? It sure does. This is exploitation at its finest. I still hear stories of widows who were taken advantage of, and they send in their money and often their life savings to some false teacher that will never contact them again. I mean, con men are bad enough, but these ones pose as spiritual leaders. And God says, your condemnation because of that is gonna be greater greater. And it says, for a pretense you make long prayers, falsely spiritual prayers that were used to build spiritual image, often for the sake of big donations. So what do they have waiting for them? Greater damnation. And this lets us know there's different degrees of punishment in hell, just like there's different degrees of rewards in heaven for those who are saved. And with greater spiritual influence comes greater responsibility and greater judgment. Like Jesus brought to this to the surface in Luke chapter 12, verses 47 and 48. And that servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself or do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. But he who did not know yet committed things deserving of stripes shall be beaten with few. For everyone to whom much is given, from him much will be required, and to whom much has been committed, of him they will ask the more. This is even in a, a New Testament parallel for those who teach the Word of God. James says, don't be many teachers. You're going to receive this stricter judgment because you are in a position of influence. And if you teach something wrong and lead people astray, there's more responsibility, more judgment. I'm done here. Oh, I mean, it's just, it's kind of scary. It's like, whoa. And so... It's just, this is hard to read. It's hard to read for me emotionally. You know, I still remember going to the Catholic Church as a young man before I was saved. And there was an 85-year-old guy who would usher there, and every week he'd be, he'd walk, he'd, 
get down on his knees and walk to the altar in the most humble position. Because he's working his way to heaven. Just hard for me. I like what Spurgeon said here. These words prove that there are degrees of punishment as there are gradations in glory. All the ungodly will be judged and condemned by the righteous judge, but the greater condemnation will be reserved for the hypocrites. Not a lot of warm fuzzies going on here, right? And so in verse 15, he brings the third row. Third row is because they lead others astray permanently. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you travel land and sea to win one proselyte or a convert, and when he is one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as you yourselves. Strong words. And this is worse, for now it's not merely a question of false teaching stopping people from entering Christ's kingdom, but of their drawing some of them to their own corrupt camp and ruining them permanently. You know, since you compass sea and land, that's a proverbial expression denoting that you're going to go to every length, every effort, every possible way you can to, to great lengths to get a convert. And the result is you make them a twofold more a child of hell than you already are. Literally it reads twice as much a son of Gehenna. And if this often happens, a, a convert to a religion is almost always twice as zealous as the one who was born and raised in. Because they've been searching and they think they found something and said, I've been searching so long and I found something that I think is right. And they join a cult and so they become their greatest advocates because they think they finally found the truth. What a tragedy. It's a double tragedy. That's what it is. And so he says, you go to great lengths to find a new disciple. I mean, that is exactly what cults do. I mean, every couple of months since the pandemic hit, we get a letter from a Jehovah Witness that's unsigned, reaching out to us. I have no idea who it is. You would think you'd sign your name and give your contact information. I'm glad this person doesn't. But you know what? They're trying to make someone a two-fold child of hell than they are. And it's just a sad reality. And when someone thinks they found the truth when it's wrong, often they just won't budge on it. They think they've, they've arrived. Imagine think you're going to heaven because you found something that you think is true and then you wake up in hell. Someone said double conviction when you're wrong only produces double condemnation. Pharisees didn't make people better, they made people worse. What's really sad though is sometimes that the zeal that some of these false converts have puts believers with, who know the truth of the gospel to shame. Do you have a zeal to see the lost one to Christ? Does that enter your brain? Do you pray for the lost that God has put in your past so that they would come to understand the gospel, the grace of God? Are you willing to open your mouth and share the gospel as the Lord gives opportunity? I mean, someone had to share it with you, right? Are you allowing the love of Christ to motivate you to yield yourself to the Lord to be his mouthpiece? This is serious business. On average, at least to be 150,000 people died every day. I think it's higher now. If you've ever read the story of Charles Peace, he was a phenomenal crook. And on his way to the gallows, in England, the customary religious dude would preach the gospel to him. And this guy decided to listen. If you're going to the gallows, you might as well listen, right? And he said to him, sir, if I believe what you and the church of God say that you believe, even if England were covered with broken glass from coast to coast, I would walk all over it, if need be, on hands and knees and think it worthwhile living just to save one soul from an eternal hell like that. The impression when I read the story is that the, the <clears throat> minister is just going through the motions. You know, doing his token duty to tell this guy that he doesn't have to go to hell. And this guy was listening. Now, does that make any sense to you? 
what he said there? Read about Charles Peace. There's people going to hell in a handbasket everywhere. And someone's got to tell them. Next woe, the fourth woe is because they are blind guides who make false promises. Verse 16, woe to you blind guides who say whoever swears by the temple it is nothing but whoever swears by the golden temple he's obliged to perform it. Fools and blind, for which is greater the gold or the temple that sanctifies the gold. And whoever swears by the altar it is nothing but whoever swears by the gift that's on it it's obliged to perform it. Fools, blind, for which is greater the gift of the altar that or that sanctifies the gift, or the altar that sanctifies the gift. Therefore, who swears by the altar, swears by it, and all things on it. He who swears by the temple, swears by it, and by him who dwells in it. And he who swears by heaven, swears by the throne of God, and by him who sits on it. No sugarcoating here, blind guides. You know, earlier in his ministry, he told his disciples that the Pharisees are blind leaders of the blind, and that the blind lead the blind, both going to the ditch. Now, does this mean Jesus didn't care? No, he's expressing, though, his absolute disgust with false teaching and those who do it. It's a blistering statement because they prided themselves on their spiritual sight and ability to guide people. But you see, what they ended up doing is making fake vows. They made promises and they developed this elaborate system in which they could get out of something they vowed because of how it was done in some technicality. And Christ is saying, this is ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. You know, swearing on an oath involved you invoking a greater witness than yourself. In fact, the writer of Hebrews uses this. He says, for men swear by one greater than themselves, and with them an oath is given as confirmation at the end of every dispute. And so in the Jewish culture in particular, making an oath was a big deal. The name of someone greater than the person making the oath is invoked to give greater credibility to what is said. And so when you're calling on God, you're inviting him to witness the truthfulness of what is said or avenge it if it's a lie. And so an oath was generally taken to be an absolute truth, which made a quote of end of every dispute because it invited judgment on the one who violated his word. So if you made an oath and you violated it, you're asking God to punish you is kind of the idea here. And the Jews didn't, weren't comfortable using the name of God in their speech, so they employed these euphemisms, like heaven or the temple or God's throne. But that all muddied the water to see if it was truly an oath that you had to keep or not. That's what he's after here. He's showing their hypocrisy. They said, well, swearing by the temple makes it invalid, but swearing by the gold of the temple makes it valid. I mean, who comes up with this? You know? The old finger crossed behind your back thing, right? Swear on your mother's grave. Remember saying that stuff as a kid? You had no idea what you were saying, you know? <laughs> but I mean, they, make, they, they came up with all these rules, and Jesus just takes them to task here. What are you doing? What are you doing? He's really saying, everything you say is hypocritical. He's saying, you know what, if you swear, you swear. If you swear by the temple, you're swearing by the temple and by him who dwells therein. So don't try to wiggle your way out of it. You're not going to be free from using what you consider to be a suitable substitute. And of course, James addresses this and he says, you know what, let your yes be yes and your no be no. And be done with it. But you see, they were manipulating and misusing the holy things of God so they could do their own thing and impress people and think of it, that God was impressed as well. But he's not done. The fifth law is because they practice legalism instead of love. Verse 23. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you pay a tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, like justice and mercy and faith. 
These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Blind guides, you strain out a gnat and you swallow a camel. And so they are obsessed with trivialities to the point where they ignore the things that really matter. They are meticulous in their tithing. And Jesus says, you know what, that's really dandy. But what about the things that really matter? Now, in the Old Testament, for the Jew, under the law, God instructed them to give one-tenth of all their crops and all their products to the treasury in Israel. And the reason they did that is because the priesthood owned no land, and the priesthood, the Levitical priesthood, was supported by the rest of the nation. This was a, way, a form of taxation. And so there was a 10% tax, if you will, on all their produce so they could support the priesthood. And so every year when you had a crop, you gave 10% of it, went to the government to support the priests. In fact, Leviticus 27.30 says, Thus all the tithe of the land, or the seed of the land, or the fruit of the tree is the Lord's. It's holy to the Lord. You give it up to support the priesthood. That was God's system of supporting the Levites. But they took it beyond the staple crops like grains and olive oil and wine and fruits and vegetables. And so if you had a little ponded plant and or, or, or an herb as mint and dill and cumin, you had to do that too. And so they were really proud of themselves to, because they were very particular with their precision in this area when it came to tithing. But they could care less if you dropped dead. They could care less if their neighbor was in real need of something else. They thought they were pleasing God with their attention to detail, and so God lowers the boom. You strain in a net, and you swallow a camel. Now, it's strain out a net. In other words, a lot of times they would drink their water and their wine, they'd have a cloth on it, so they drank it because a gnat was an unclean animal. The word strain there means to filter. In fact, the smallest unclean animal was a gnat. It was considered unclean. The Jews had a law that forbade them eating any flying insects that did not have jointed legs for hopping. You could eat a grasshopper, but you couldn't eat a gnat. I didn't make up the law. I'm just telling you what's in there. All right? But since the water could have insects in it, the pious Jews were careful to strain the water through the cloth before drinking it. They didn't want to accidentally drink a gnat and make themselves unclean. Oh boy, huh? But he said, you gulp down a camel, which was also an unclean animal. The GNT translated this way, you strain a fly out of your drink, but you swallow a camel. And so Jesus accuses them of taking great pains to avoid an offense in minor things of little importance by tolerating these great sins. That's what the swallowing camels refers to, like deceit and oppression and unforgiveness. They majored in the minors. They had rules for every minute area of life, and at the same time, they ignored the things that mattered as far as God is concerned. Micah 6 eight. what does the Lord require of you but to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? That was the point. Well, the good news today is I filtered out my water, so I'm feeling pretty good about myself, right? But do you love mercy? Do you walk humbly with your God? Are you acting justly? Scribes and Pharisees didn't act justly at all. They were unfair, they were unjust, they were unmerciful, they were brutal, unforgiving, unkind, ungenerous, they abused people. In fact, in the beginning of this chapter, in verse four, what did Jesus say about the Pharisees? For they bind heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. They were concerned about the details, that's fine, but they neglected the larger issues, so they proved to be blind guides. You know, that's legalism at its finest right there, at its finest. 
You know, in the legal, there's legalists in, in Christendom. In some religious circles, you're considered lower than dirt because you don't wear the right clothes or eat the right foods or you don't have the right school choice or whatever it might be. But do you love your neighbor? No, man, we don't eat Big Macs, but do you love your neighbor? No, let them go to hell. I don't care less, but I don't eat Big Macs. Sticklers for details, but blind to the relational principles that the Holy Spirit seeks to produce in us and through us. See, legalism has got a, it's a way of thinking. It's not necessarily what you do, it's how you look at what you do. But you've got this merit, you've got this merit principle, whether it's rituals, good works, whether it's, it's, it's thinking, you know, you think you're better than the average bear because you don't do certain things or you do do certain things. It's performance-based. Your identity is tied to your performance. And every legalist is in bondage to how they're perceived in the eyes of others. And fear of failure can dominate their mind. As some would rather die than ever said, well, I screwed up there. And it's full of unbiblical rules. You can't listen to that. You can't wear that. You can't watch that. How dare you play a card game? You know, you can do all those things just dandy, be dead as a doorknob spiritually. Legalism has nothing to do with love. Well, maybe love for yourself. It's a, you know, one of the things God wants you to understand as a believer in Christ is you've been made free from a rule approach to Christianity. It's not how you live your life. Paul had to tell the Corinthians, or the Galatians, stand fast in the liberty which has made you free. Free from these rules. Don't be entangled again into those rules. See, you've been called to liberty. You're free from the rules, but what do you to do with that liberty? Don't use it to puff yourself up and impress others with your fact that you tied your little pinch of mint last week. No. It frees you up to love and serve one another. That's the point. All the laws fulfilled in one word, even this, you're going to love your neighbor yourself. That's the point. It was the whole point of the law, and yet they missed it. And legalists miss it. Peter had to tell this. He says, this is a will of God that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. It's free. Don't use your liberty as vice, but as a servant of God, a slave of God. See, the issue is, are you having a love affair with Christ? Are you allowing his love to constrain you and direct your thinking so you consider him and consider others in love? You've got a humble mind that says, Lord, in what way can I be a vessel of mercy to my brother in Christ or my sister in Christ or to the neighbor lady? It's the Holy Spirit that can direct you to think with the mind of Christ so that you love one another, not condemn them because they eat Big Macs and you eat Fruit Loops or whatever it is you eat. This is why Galatians 5.16 says, this I say then walk in or by means of the Spirit and you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. The Spirit of God can direct you to love others. And the rules mean nothing. The fruit of the Spirit is love. That's the privilege we have as believers. You know, vice here means wickedness. And so these Pharisees maximized the minor things and minimized the major things. And you know, one of the reasons people are turned off at Christianity is because their perception of it is that it's a bunch of rules that they'd rather not follow. Well, you know, if I gotta do this for God to love me, well then forget it. And so the message is indirectly sent, well, if you don't do the rules, God doesn't love you, and he only exists to condemn you. And that's how the Pharisees acted, and that's why the tax collectors, never did you hear a tax collector, I'm gonna go visit a Pharisee, so I can feel really good about myself. Oh, I avoided them like the plague. We're not under the law, we're under grace. See, living under the law is a mindset that says, I better do this or I'll get caught, and there's a penalty to be paid. Or, since I didn't fail there, I've made the grade and I'm feeling pretty good about myself, and you should too, right? 
Isn't that the issue? See, the Pharisees lack love. You don't need love to obey rules. You can obey all the rules perfectly with all kinds of hate in your heart. I mean, you can feel pretty good because you've got a clean house, you don't eat fast food, and you didn't play cards last night. Who cares? I mean, who really cares? If you think you have to have a clean house to enjoy life, you're in sad shape. <laughs> That's just the worst trap there is. You know, a lot of times when you're legalist and you're thinking you come to church and you have to look the part because you don't want to get caught. You're into looking good so people will think well of you. You're missing the whole point. You have to come to church looking over your shoulder. And then you've got to worry about things that don't matter. Because it's all about you instead of about the Lord. And that's the Pharisee. There's no love, there's no mercy, there's no justice, there's no grace in any of that. And I tell you what, when you have a church that's wrapped up in that, you have schism and divisions, you have the organic people over here and the non-organic people over here. Who cares? You got the vegans over here and the meat eaters over here. Who cares? If you're thinking spiritually along those lines, you've missed it. I think I've said enough. Sixth woe is because they were concerned about appearing righteous instead of being righteous. Got to get going here. Where am I? Uh, Verse 25, Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first cleanse, cleanse the inside of the cup and dish, that the outside of them may be clean also. See, these religious leaders were impure both inside and out, and they masked over their true character by being careful to keep the ceremonial laws so they would appear pious. And he says, you know, you got a licking cup there, but let's look on the inside. Ooh, ish. You know, and, and, and this is explained in Mark. He says, for the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands in a special way, holding the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other things which they have received and hold, like the washing of cups, pitchers, copper vessels, and couches. I mean, they had the whole rigmarole. And the disciples are walking through eating grain with unwashed hands. The Pharisees' heads explode. How can you say you're of God? And you do that. He says, inside you're full of extortion and self-indulgence. So he says, you know what? If you clean the inside, the outside will take care of itself. That's how it is. And so the idea is there, they were all into appearances. You know, and there's a lot of deceived people that think if they go to church and talk nicely and give a bit of money to a charitable cause or do their civic duty, it doesn't matter if they're dishonest in their business or covetousness or have cruel dealings with family members or they're arrogant. He says, you look good on the outside, but inside you are in really sad shape. And the next one's related to it. Whoops. Seventh woe is because they were concerned about appearing righteous while ignoring their evil hearts. He's, he continues on in verse 27. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so outwardly you appear righteous to men, but inside you're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Well, he's laying it on thick here. And the whole white, I, I mentioned this before in our series of Life of Christ, all these pilgrims would come to Jerusalem, that there was, they would go out and they'd whitewash all the tombs because if you stepped on a, a grave, unbeknowingly you were unclean, you missed the Passover. And so people would go out and they'd clean these things and they'd whitewash them. They'd put some kind of chalk on them to make them noticeable and look good. But what's on the inside? 
So the term was, they whitewashed this. They whitewashed. And he said, that's what you are, but you know what? You look good on the outside, but on the inside, man, you're full of dead men's bones. You're unclean. You're unclean. And that's, again, misses the point. What's the eighth wall? They rejected it. This is probably, this is the culminating woe, if you will. Verse 29, woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous. And say, if, you know, if we lived in the days of our fathers, we wouldn't have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. We wouldn't have killed them like our forefathers did. Therefore, you are witnesses against yourselves that you are the sons of those who murdered the prophets. You're the same thing. Fill up then the measure of your father's guilt. In other words, kill me, which is what they're going to do in two days. Verse 33, serpents, you brood of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? Therefore, indeed, I send you prophets, wise men, and scribes, and some of them you're going to kill and crucify, and some of them you're going to scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city, that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth from the blood of the righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Bar Baraka, or Barakiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Assuredly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. No sugarcoating here. And he's saying, you say you were no different, but you are different, and I'm, how am I going to prove it? Because again, in two days, I'm the ultimate prophet, and you're going to fulfill it to the max because you're going to kill me. Like every one of your forefathers, every person that God sent to them, they murdered. Starting with Abel, the first prophet, Zechariah was the last one mentioned in, I think it's 2 Chronicles. They were all killed by the religious leaders that didn't like their message. Isn't that amazing? Now you're thinking, why is he doing this? He's actually, this is his last chance to reach out to them. And I mentioned earlier, sometimes love has to speak harshly because that's the only time love is ever going to get through. But he calls them vipers, small poisonous snakes that live in the region, and they look like sticks, and their bite was deadly. That's what Paul got bit with in Acts 28 or whatever it was. So how does God feel about false teaching? Not real good, does he? But someone has made the observation, and we're going to look at this, and this isn't ironclad, but comparing the righteous that he mentioned in the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount with the condemnation of the religious leaders at the end. There's the blessings of Matthew 5 and the woes of Matthew 23. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What are the woes? You shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. You don't go in yourselves. And so here, the poor in spirit, if you've got a humble heart, that's what's required to enter the kingdom. Here, they were proud and arrogant were preventing people to go to the kingdom. Matthew 5, 4, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. What did the Pharisees do? Instead of helping the widows mourn, they devoured them. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. You travel land and sea, and when one proselyte, when he's one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as you are. See the contrast? They weren't meek at all. They weren't inheriting the earth. They weren't going to go into the kingdom. And they're going to make sure others don't either. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They shall be filled. Whoever swears by the temple, it's nothing. Whatever swears by the golden temple, he's obliged to perform it. I've got comments on this. But, I'm like, don't, but the printer didn't work real well, so I uh, really can't tell you what I wrote here. <laughs> Blessed are the merciful, they shall obtain mercy. What did they neglect? Justice, mercy, and faith. 
Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Inside, they're full of extortion and self-indulgence. They were clean on the outside, but they were not pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers, they shall be called sons of God. You're inside, you're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And what are they going to do? In fact, he predicts what they're going to do to his disciples. Did you notice that in verse 34? Therefore, indeed, I shall send you prophets, wise men and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city. This is going to happen to the disciples. He's predicting what they're going to do to his disciples when they after the ascension and the church begins and they preach the gospel. And it is, there's a reward for those that walk by faith and are righteous. Rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. He says all these things will be come upon this generation. That's the reward for their persecution of the truth and of Christ. Interesting, isn't it? This wasn't, a, again, a warm and fuzzy passage, but it's a, it speaks to the reality of the false teaching that's out there and how Christ feels about it and how that's the very thing that is causing people who actually want to go to heaven not to go to heaven. So again, this is serious business, something that we need to take to heart and it reminds us that we're to be his mouthpieces and be vessels of love and mercy and grace to share with others the truth that'll set them free. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your mercy. We know this is a powerfully convicting passage in many ways. Uh, we know that you are a righteous God and you're a holy God and that these things matter. And I pray that they would matter to us. But we thank you you're the God of grace and the God of love as well and you're willing that no one perish. And may we have a humble and reverent heart before you, seeking to honor you in all things and to even speak the truth in love. And we pray for those that are lost, that you could even direct us. And we can cross paths and we can share with them the, the very message of the gospel that will set their soul free for all eternity. Thank you for these opportunities you do give us. We thank you for how you've worked thus far, even in our fair, just as you continue to work even today for the saints in Alaska.